Hello and welcome to the video. This is the first video in a short series looking at the TBS Crossfire. We're going to talk about what it is, why you would want to use it, and then we're very quickly going to show you the setup as well. I'm planning on a couple of other videos after this to get into more of the technical nitty gritty. So if there's something that you're interested in understanding more about, then please put your comments and questions below this video and I'll try and answer the ones I can and include that detail in the subsequent videos too. Need to say a very big thank you to Team Black Sheep who are supporting me here to make sure that all the information for this series is as up to date as it can possibly be. The Crossfire system has been updated dramatically over its life and continues to have updates and innovations popped on there as well. So as I'm recording this in the beginning of October, this stuff is up to date, but there are a couple of caveats. So be careful of that if you're watching this 12 months from now and you're looking at this stuff, always go back and just double check the manuals, have a look at the information on the TBS website for the latest and greatest information. So without any further ado, let's just talk about what the Crossfire is before we actually go through a quick setup. So the most obvious one that everyone thinks about is that this Crossfire is for much longer range flights. Whereas we'll get about one, one and a half kilometers on 2.4 gigahertz, which most of us are flying with today, you will get multiple kilometers of distance out of a Crossfire. And depending on the power that you select for your Crossfire, you will be able to get longer and longer flights. The challenge, of course, is not all power levels are legal in all countries, but we'll come on to that in a second. The way it does that is using much, much lower frequencies. It's not using the 2.4 gigahertz, it's down at the 900 megahertz range. As you lower the frequency, the wavelength of the signal gets a lot longer and it has much more penetrating power, so it goes further on the same amount of power. The Crossfire system uses a two-way communication protocol that's very low latency, and that allows us to do some pretty funky things. So we can both send and receive information from our model and do configuration on the radio and some really smart stuff that will be coming soon. The receivers can be configured to work in any way you want. They can output PPM, PWM, SBUS, or CRSF. Now we're going to talk about CRSF a lot in this video and that is the protocol that TBS has developed. It's the Crossfire protocol that's now open so other people can develop for it as well. It's very high speed, it's very low latency, it's a very resilient digital signal that again has all of that goodness of being a two-way protocol. It's much faster than SBUS, it's much faster than PPM, and it gives us the best low latency connection up to the model. So if you're a pilot that wants the absolute maximum locked-in feel of being connected to your model, Crossfire is worthwhile looking at too. It does have that selectable RF power. There are two modules available for the transmitter module that goes in the back of the radio. There's the one we have here, which is the Crossfire, and then there's the Crossfire Micro 2. The microtransmitter has a few less features than the one that we're using here, but the principles are exactly the same. The big difference is the micro doesn't have the same high-end transmission as the full-size module. The full-size module will go to 2,000 milliwatts or 2 watts of transmitting power, although you have to connect it to an external battery to do that, whereas the micro module will only go up to 100 milliwatts of transmitting power, which will still give you much, much more range than a standard 2.4 gigahertz radio. On the larger Crossfire transmitter module, the one we'll use for this series, it has a dedicated head tracker port, so we can plug our head tracker in easily into the back. It has a Bluetooth wireless connection, so you can connect to it with an app or a tablet and change things as well. There are two receivers currently available. Uh, there's a full-size one that has an inbuilt battery, uh, antenna diversity, and some very clever stuff too. And then we have a little micro-size receiver. Uh, we're using the V2 here because we want to use the CRSF protocol at both ends. We'll talk about that again in a second. And that's perfect for things like multi-rotors and drones. The smaller Crossfire micro transmitter module doesn't have a screen. The one that we're using here does, and you are going to have to have either the screen or OpenTX 2.2 and the Lua script or something like a TBS Tango to be able to go into the settings to change everything if you're using the Crossfire micro because it doesn't have the little screen and joystick at the back. So let's very quickly go through and show 
what the setup of this thing looks like because it's actually not as complicated as you think. So let's look at a traditional system. I will have our Tronus radio on the left hand side, 2.4 gigahertz signal. Again, this one is bi-directional for Tronus because it has the telemetry going up to a radio receiver or an XSR or whatever it is you're using and then plugged into a flight controller. And the radio receiver is probably talking to the flight controller over SBUS. Most of us are using SBUS these days. It's a nice fast digital signal and works really well. If we look at that and compare it with a crossfire system, the Tronus radio is sending the information of where the sticks and sliders are to the radio module, the crossfire radio module via CRSF protocol. So that CRSF protocol is the very quick low latency way. I think it's about 10 times faster than PPM to get the information up into the module and out the back through the antenna. Then there's a much lower frequency radio link, about 900 megahertz. Again, talk about that in a second, that takes you from the radio up to the radio receiver. The radio receiver then, then receives that and then can talk PPM, PWM, SBUS, but for the fastest speed and also some of the really funky stuff that's coming, you're gonna to want to be running CRSF into your flight controller. So those are the differences between the two. So let's very quickly go through and set this thing up. So first of all, let's install the module into the back of the radio. Now the module is going to go into the JR bay, but the first thing I do is pop the antenna on. You never want to power a radio transmitter without the antenna installed, and then download the TBS agent software and update it before you do anything else. It'll be powered from the USB cable. You don't have to connect to anything else. You plug it in, let it go through the update, and then you're using the latest and greatest firmware. Quick tip here, if you're doing anything with the Crossfire, particularly with firmware, make sure you are viewing all the unstable releases or the beta versions and go for the latest and greatest version. I'm doing that here and it's meaning that everything is working. The way that TBS works with the beta versions is a little bit different from lots of other manufacturers. And what they do is they release some software. If there aren't any error reports in the two week period, then it goes to being gold and released. However, they're innovating and changing things so quickly at the moment that they're not getting to the end of that two week cycle without them changing something themselves. So don't worry about it, go for the latest and greatest and you'll have the best chance of getting everything working. You'll probably notice as part of the update it will also copy over the firmware, the latest and greatest firmware for the receivers as well. And that's because in a moment when we bind it to the receiver it's going to update the receiver wirelessly automatically too, which is quite cute. Next thing to do then is once we've done the update, install the module into the rear of the radio. Be very careful with the pins in these JR style bays. They have to be straight. If you have any kind of resistance at all trying to plug the module in, stop, remove the module and find out what the problem is. If you bend one of these pins at the back of the radio, you're going to be snookered. Once the module is in the radio, then you need to enable the external module in the radio itself and select CRSF as the protocol that you want to use to talk to the module as well. Now again, if you're using a radio that isn't using OpenTX 2.2, but has the ability to use PPM to talk to the modules externally, you could use that. You should find that on the screen of the larger crossfire that we have here, you can see it tells us that it can understand the radio, it's powered up, and it can hear CRSF2. And then depending on what radio you've got depends on how you do the configuration. Now we're lucky here because we have the big crossfire and we have the menu. So I'm going to do lots of the setup with the menu system in here. But if you were going to be using a radio, then you need to be running OpenTX 2.2 really, and you want to be running the crossfire Lua script. The Crossfire Lua scripts are part of the SD card contents available from a download area. I'll put a link in the description if you want to get hold of it. At the time of recording, there's a Lua script for the Tronus X9D radio, and there's one that's almost here for the QX7 radio as well. So by the time you're watching this, hopefully that script will be available. First time you power on the module, you're going to have to set the region. FCC, CE or whatever and that won't limit the frequencies you can use but it will limit the output power for the region that you're in. It's going to only ask you that once so be very careful and make sure that you pick the right one. Last thing to do is pay attention to antenna orientation. Ideally you want the antennas vertically and mount the antennas on the craft vertically as well because antenna orientation is probably one of the top mistakes that newer pilots make. Now we've got the radio set up, then we need to bind the receiver. 
Now this is really straightforward. All we're going to do is we're going to power the radio. We're going to put the crossfire system into binding mode. It's going to sit there waiting to hear from a receiver. If a receiver has never been bound, first time you power it up, it's going to be looking for a radio to connect to. But if it's already been bound, you just press the little button briefly on the receiver and that will put it into bind mode. So we're going to power it up. The radio is going to see the receiver, make the connection, and then it's going to push the firmware up to the receiver too. Once that's all done, don't forget that you also need to set up the failsafe so the receiver knows what to do when there's a problem. Once you've got that set up, then you can go into the menu on the radio and configure how you want the radio receiver to output the signals, whether it is PPMS bus or ideally CRSF to get the most from the system. Now, because I'm using this micro receiver, I'm going to set up pins one and two to be the CRSF transmit and CRSF receive pins and then I'm going to wire those two pins to a spare UART port on the flight controller. Now CRSF is a high speed digital protocol so but by default a lot of flight controllers don't support it on anything but a UART. It's implemented in beta flight. Firmwares that use beta flight as their basis also have it in there as well. So what you need to do to wire it up to your flight controller it's pretty straightforward. You just need to get the wire that you've selected as the CRSF transmit pin and connect that to the receive pin on the spare UART on your flight controller. And similarly, receive pin, you need to plug that into the transmit pin on the same UART. Now, be a little bit careful on here. and Not all UARTs will support all protocols, so you might have to try another UART if this doesn't work. But then once you've got that set up, then go into beta flight connect to your flight controller and then find in the ports menu the UART that you're interested in and then what you need to do is select CRSF as the protocol you're interested in and you should be in business. So hopefully that helps those of you that have never seen the Crossfire system before or have just got it and are looking at all the pieces and are trying to put it all together. It isn't particularly complicated. If you follow this process, hopefully you should have it all working. There are a couple of gotchas that we'll cover in other videos, but it's worthwhile mentioning now. The first gotcha is that at the moment, the support for the QX7 radio for the Crossfire isn't quite complete. The QX7 has a couple of little problems. The first problem is there's a little bit of hardware inside the radio, which isn't very good. And that means you can't run the CRSF protocol at full speed from the QRX7 to the module itself in the back of the radio. Now there's going to be a couple of fixes for that. The first one is in OpenTX 2.2.1. There's going to be the ability for you to reduce that speed to about a fourth of what it should be and that will allow that slow inverter that's inside the radio to be able to send and receive the CRSF protocol. Uh, if you try and run it at full speed you'll find that you'll get lots of telemetry errors. So OpenTX 2.2.1 will fix that problem and allow you to use it but unfortunately the compromise is you're not going to be running the CRSF link from the radio to the Crossfire module at full speed or the other way that's happening is that a number of hardware mods that you can take the back off the radio and fire up your soldering iron and actually do some changes too. Now there's a couple that's already out and there's also an open source project to produce some boards that are going to be able to fix that as well. So right now, if you're going to use Crossfire, I, I would say get an X9D or get your TBS Tango or give it a couple of months and the QX7 will be all sorted as well. One of the other problems that a lot of new pilots make is antenna alignment. You want to make sure the antennas are aligned on the model and on the radio as well. I would recommend put your antennas vertically on the back of the radio and then mount the antennas from the receiver vertically as well. So one of them's pointing up and one of them's pointing down or they're at 90 degrees with one of them pointing up and one of them pointing back. And that's quite a nice way to do it on things like quadcopters because as you're rolling and flipping around, hopefully one of the antennas is still lining up with the receiver. And that's because as the physical antennas get out of phase, then you will lose an awful lot of that signal. So you need to put a bit of thought into that. And the last thing is, if you're going to use the CRSF protocol, which I'd recommend because that's 
part of the benefit of using the Crossfire system with your flight controller. If you're going to use that, make sure you have a spare UART. Again, just be a little bit careful. Some UARTs won't run on some protocols. It's just the way that the architecture is implemented in some flight controllers. So I would test it and be prepared to try another spare UART if the one you connected up to, you don't get any signals out of your Crossfire system. Just try it on another UART, you'll probably find it'll work. So thank you for bearing with me in the first video in our series. If there's anything you want to see in detail, pop it down below and we'll look at this system in a lot more detail in the next couple of videos. Thank you for taking the time to watch that video and particularly for watching right to the very end. We try and release a video on Tuesday and Friday and sometimes we'll release one or two extra ones in a week as well. All of the videos on the channel are organised into easy to use playlists so do have a look in there because if you're interested in a subject we organise all the videos on that subject so you can find them easily all together in one place. If you like what we're doing then please like and subscribe and tell others about the channel so they can come and join as well. We're available in all of the usual social media places, particularly in places like Instagram, Twitter, and we also share all of our 3D designs on Thingiverse.